Welcome to LG Ministry. We are glad you have chosen to watch our program today. My name is Coogan Collins and I am the minister at the Long Grove Church of Christ. Our hope and desire is that you will open up your Bible and study along with us. So let's get to our lesson. There are a lot of people who have no idea what the Church of Christ is like. But there are plenty of people who are confused about what we stand for and what we teach. I would like to talk about a few of these things that I wish people understood about the Church of Christ. These things I'm going to talk about are in no particular order. Many today seem to think that the Church of Christ is just another denomination mixed in with the over 30,000 that are in existence today. No doubt the devil has done a great job at causing confusion because finding the truth among 30,000 different groups is like finding an eyelash on black carpet. However, if one looks for the truth, I believe they can find the truth. As Jesus said in John 8 verse 31, Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Jesus tells us the way that we can know the truth that will set us free is by abiding in his word. This means that we have to ignore what man says and we must focus on what God's word says about salvation and life. I want you to notice this simple yet powerful argument. Hebrews 11 verse number six, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. In Hebrews chapter 11, we learn about all kinds of faithful men and women who trusted in God and followed His commands. It follows that if we want to be pleasing to God, then we too must be faithful to God and His commands. Paul tells us exactly where faith comes from in Romans 10 and verse 17. Then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So if we want to be pleasing to God, we must do things His way. Our faith and the things that we do must be found within God's Word. As Paul told Timothy, 2 Timothy 3 verse 16, All Scripture is given by inspiration to God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Jesus certainly emphasizes this principle in Matthew 15, starting in verse 1. Then the scribes and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus, saying, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. He answered and said to them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor your father and your mother. And he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, whoever says to his father or mother, whatever profit you might have received from me is a gift to God. Then he need not honor his father or mother. Thus you have made the commandment of God of no effect by your tradition. Hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. These Jews had created traditions that they had turned into laws, and in some cases they held their traditions above the law of God. Many love to do this, which is why we have over 30,000 denominations today. It all has to do with people who didn't like a particular teaching, or they came up with their own traditions that they wanted others to follow. And thus, denominations were born. However, when it comes to the Church of Christ, 
We are people who believe that the New Testament is our authority. We do our best to ignore opinions or what feels right or wrong within our hearts. And we allow the Word of God to be our God. We completely agree with Solomon who wrote this many years ago in Proverbs 3 and verse number 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct your paths. Or as Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 4 and verse number 6, Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes, that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. It is certainly not easy to set aside your feelings, opinions, or traditions that develop over the years. But our goal is to be a reflection of the church that you read about in the New Testament. Since we rely on the Word of God for the things that we do and teach, we can firmly say that there is only one church, which means that denominations are not the true church because they are a division that have their own ideas and man-made traditions. It is easy to say this, but let's prove it from the Word of God. Matthew 16, verse 15. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Jesus is talking to his disciples about who people think he is. Then he asked them, who do you think I am? This is where we see Peter's great confession of Jesus being the Son of God. But notice in verse 18, Jesus said that he would build my church. This is in the singular. And this is the same idea taught throughout the New Testament. Ephesians 1 verse 22, And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. There is just one Jesus and he is the head over the church, singular, which is also called his body. When you think about this image, do you think about a one-headed Jesus with 30,000 different bodies that are doing their own thing? Of course not. There is one head and there is one body. Paul wrote in Ephesians 4 and verse number 4, There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. No one argues and says that there are a multitude of fathers, and we shouldn't argue that there are a multitude of bodies, because there's just one. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. For in fact the body is not one member, but many. Romans 12, verse number 4, for as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. So we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Every Christian makes up the one body slash church that Jesus purchased with his blood. Many more scriptures can be given that repeats this fundamental lesson that there is just one church slash body. Some might think that all denominations belong to the one body even though they call themselves after other men or practices. They don't seem to think that it really matters if they do things their way. But Paul condemns such behavior in 1 Corinthians 1 starting in verse 10. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that you all speak the same thing and that there be no division among you but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? 
or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Paul was a man who expressed his concern for the churches over and over again. In fact, we learn from Acts 20 that he even shed tears over his concerns for the church at Ephesus because he wanted them to remain true to God. In our immediate text, we see that the Corinthians had started calling themselves after mere men. This is why we see Paul pleading with all his being that they would not be divided or call themselves after men because there was only one man who died for them, and that was Jesus. It is not possible to have spiritual unity without Jesus being our head. So Paul forbids division in these scriptures. When we allow ourselves to be divided into different religious groups, worshiping in different ways, and calling ourselves by different names, all we are doing is causing confusion. And we all know that God is not the author of confusion. So it is imperative as Christians today that we don't accept denominationalism because God doesn't want His people to be divided. The only way that we can truly be united with God and with each other is by allowing God's Word and His Word only to be our guide. If we add to or take away from His authority, we will not be in unity with Him, which is our first priority. People can be in unity with themselves all day long, like the people who were building the Tower of Babel. But they found out that having unity with each other, but not with God, does not work. And it will not make you right with God. So this means that we should not be open to fellowship spiritually with those who choose to divide themselves from God's pattern of worship. Now I'm not talking about ceasing from reaching out to the religious world. But we should not be sharing our pulpits with them or doing things that imply that we agree with their additions or subtractions from God's Word. When people in the Church of Christ start talking like this, some get offended and start calling us names and saying that we're being too harsh. But we are not. We are simply teaching what the Bible teaches. I would have to say to those who think that we're being mean-spirited and exclusive, I would have to say to the, the same thing that Paul said in Galatians 4 and verse 16. Have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? If you belong to a denomination, do a little bit of research and you'll find out that your denomination was created somewhere between the 1500s and now. Even the Catholic Church did not officially begin until AD 325. However, the church that Christ built was prophesied about in Isaiah 2, starting in verse 2. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all the nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Verse 2 is prophesying of the church, and it has several elements to it. Number one, it would happen at a certain time, latter days. Number two, it would be built at a location established on the top of the mountains. Number three, it would be exalted above others, exalted above the hills. Number four, it would involve all nations. All nations shall flow to it. This same prophecy is repeated by Micah in Micah 4 verses 1 through 3. The latter days would be sometime in the future. Joel also tells us what will happen when these events happen that Isaiah was talking about. Joel 2 verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also on my men servants and on my maid servants I will pour out my spirit in those days. Daniel also talks about the latter days as well. Daniel 2 verse 28. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the vision of your head upon your bed were these. Now Daniel goes on to describe the future empires based upon the image that the king saw in verses 31 through 34. The head of gold was King Nebuchadnezzar. The breast of arms and silver was the Medo-Persian Empire. 
The belly and thighs of brass was grease, and the legs of iron and feet of iron mixed with clay was the Roman Empire from 63 BC to 476 AD. In verse 44, Daniel tells of an everlasting kingdom, which is the church, that would be set up during the fourth kingdom, which was the Roman Empire. Daniel 2 verse 44. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. All of these prophecies about latter days, those days, and those things that take place afterward all point to the great event that happened on the day of Pentecost during the Roman Empire. In fact, Peter specifically tells us when Joel's prophecy was being fulfilled in Acts 2, starting in verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your young men shall see visions, your old men shall see dreams, and on my men servants and on my maid servants I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. By Peter stating that Joel's prophecy was being fulfilled, it means that all other prophecies that had to do with the Messiah and his kingdom were also being fulfilled. The reign of Christ would be in the latter days, and his reign would never be succeeded by anyone else. There will be no other age or dispensation of time. There is an easy way for us to remember this. The prophecies of Isaiah 2, Joel 2, and Daniel 2 were fulfilled in Acts chapter 2. Isaiah also said in verse 3, For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. This verse is saying the same thing since the word of God is his law. His word slash law would go forth from Jerusalem because that is where it first began to be revealed in Acts chapter 2. Notice what Jesus told his disciples in Luke 22 verse 46. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Notice what Jesus tells his disciples shortly before his ascension into heaven in Acts 1 and verse 4. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus makes it easy for us to see that this new law was not the same law of the Old Testament, but it was something different and it would have its beginning at Jerusalem. And then it would go out from there to all these places and to all the nations. This would also fulfill the prophecy of Jeremiah, who said in Jeremiah 31, verse 31, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. 
for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. So this new law and its teachings would happen at the establishment of the kingdom slash church that would begin at Jerusalem in AD 30. So the church singular that Jesus bought and paid for with his blood is the church slash body slash kingdom that we read about in the New Testament. It is the church that we must belong to in order to be saved. As Paul said in Ephesians 5 and verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. I'm gonna to have to wait to give you more details of the things that I wish others understood about the Church of Christ, but I want to point out one quick fact from scripture. I've been talking a lot about there only being one body and that we must be a part of that body in order to be saved. Most of those in denominations have adapted a false view of salvation. Now, most of them understand the concept that without God's grace, we cannot be saved. Most of them understand that salvation only comes through Jesus, and He is the only one who has made salvation possible for us at all. But the teachings of denominations go in all kinds of different directions after this. Some teach that you're saved by faith alone or grace alone. Some say that you have to say a sinner's prayer, ask Jesus into your heart, even though these ideas are not found anywhere in Scripture. Since the Church of Christ believes that God's Word should be our guide, let us notice what it says about salvation. It says you must hear the Word of God, Romans 10 verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. James 1, 21, Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. So we must hear God's word and receive it because it contains the words of life. We must believe in Jesus, John 8, 24. Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins for if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. We must repent. Luke 13, verse 3, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. We must confess Jesus as our Lord. Matthew 10, verse 32, Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. We must be baptized for the forgiveness of our sins. Acts 2, verse 38. Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Once our sins have been forgiven, we are to remain faithful to the Lord until the day that we die. Revelation 2, verse number 10. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. One thing that most denominations teach is that baptism is not necessary for salvation, even though Peter said it is for the forgiveness of sins. That's like telling someone they don't need to eat or drink to live, which we know is not true. Besides this, the Bible also teaches us that baptism is the point that we are added to the church. We can see this in several ways. First, if you drop down to verse 47 in Acts chapter 2, you will see that it was God that added those who were baptized into the church. Acts 2 verse 47, And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Also compare the following verses, John 3 verse number 5, Jesus answered, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13, For by one Spirit you were all baptized into one body. Notice that Jesus and Paul are both talking about how one gets into the body and kingdom, which is the church. Jesus tells us this happens by being born of water and the Spirit. And Paul says, by one Spirit you are baptized into the one body. So as the Holy Spirit instructs us through His sword, which is the Word of God, we see that when we are baptized in water, we are added to the one church by God. We can see this again by how the Bible says we get into Christ. Galatians 3 verse 27. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. 
Romans 6 in verse number 3, Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? When you think about the imagery that Paul talks about in Romans chapter 6 when it comes to baptism, it becomes quite clear that baptism fits perfectly with this idea of being born again because Paul teaches us that at our baptism we are being buried with Christ and our old man is dying. And then we are being raised up a new creature in Christ with our sins forgiven. So not only do the scriptures teach that baptism is the point that our sins are forgiven, it is the point that we are added to the church you read about in the New Testament. There is nothing wrong with telling people this because it is what the scriptures teach. And the scriptures are what we must go by in order to find the truth and also to come out of denominationalism so that we can be unified with God. We in the Church of Christ simply want the true thought. And we want people to become Christians as the Bible teaches. We want Christians to be unified with God and each other based on God's Word. I have much more to say about all of this, but I will close this lesson with part of the Lord's Prayer for us to think on. John 17, verse 14. I have given them your Word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they may also be sanctified by the truth. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one, just as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you. And these have known that you sent me, and I have declared to them your name, and will declare it, that the love with which you love me may be in them, and I in them.